It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, Larry LeSeur and Charles Collingwood. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Herbert Morrison, Deputy Leader of the British Labor Party and Member of Parliament. Well, since the British Labor Party has been out of office, the most noteworthy event that has occurred has been the, British, the visit of its leader to Red China. And of course, this visit uh, has aroused much controversy, this mission to Beiping in the United States. So we're eager to ask Mr. Morrison tonight uh, just how much significance should be attached to this visit to Red China? Well, it is of some significance because it's the first British official Labour delegation to Communist China. In principle, it is not new because we have had such visits uh, now and again to the Soviet Union. And our approach is this, that here is this big thing that's happened in the world it's a good thing for our people to see at um, first hand, as far as they could, what is happening, uh, to exchange views, and a very good thing for the Chinese behind the Iron Curtain to meet our people. Uh, that is the basis of it. And at the end of the day, our people have come back. They are no more converted to communism than when they went. And I don't suppose that the Chinese communists are any more converted to Western ways of thought than when they went. But we believe that in principle it was a right and a good thing, does nobody any harm, and may conceivably do a little good. You don't feel, Mr. Morrison, that uh, Mr. Attlee's trip and that of your colleagues in the Labour Party fostered illusions about the possibility of cooperating with the communists both in China and in Russia? Um, I, I don't think so. We would wish to cooperate if they are ready, genuinely, to cooperate for the peace of the world. Uh, naturally, uh, that's our point of view. But um, I, I don't think that it has caused us to be um, innocents abroad, so to speak. And I don't gather that from the articles that, member, that members of the delegation have written about it. Mr. Morrison, of course, the uh, matter of timing, I think, was rather important. We've had some trouble in this country with the Red Chinese, which no doubt you know about. Yes, they've sir. taken our prisoners. They haven't released a lot of them. And they've been uh, rather uh, difficult to deal with, to say the least. Now, would this visit actually mark a division between this country and Great Britain in the Pacific, do you think? <coughs> well, I, I understand the American point of view, I think. Um, I don't wholly sympathize uh, with everything that is said about it, because, if I may say so with respect, the, your country has a rather habit of uh, fierce speaking, whereas the British would go a little bit softer. Not that it indicates a fundamental difference in, in, in the point of view. But I understand the American point of view. And I have, uh, I have every reason to appreciate, while I've been here, the degree of American feeling about it. I don't think, however, that it need involve any permanent estrangement between the two countries, which I, for one, would think would be a great tragedy. Well, Mr. Morrison, as far back as I can remember, you've been one of the bitterest foes of communism that Moscow ever had. But does your apparent approval of Mr. Attlee's visit to Red China um, foretoken a change of mind on your part? No, no, I, I am still strongly opposed to um, Communism, the totalitarian philosophy, and the idea of dictatorship, I believe in the cause of freedom. I believe in particular the right of the ordinary common or garden citizen to oppose his government and to seek by peaceful means to get a different one. Therefore, I am strongly anti-communist, and my views are in no way modified. Well, could we attribute this visit then possibly to uh, domestic politics in Great Britain? No, you, you can only attribute it to the reasons that I gave you in answer to an earlier question. Uh, I don't think that it, it was, in any sense, a tactical move in relation to um, internal British political party strategy. What are the, you mentioned, you talk about communism, Mr. Morrison, rather than Chinese communism in particular. A good many observers feel that one of the differences between the American point of view on the world situation and the British point of view is that uh, we take more seriously than you the possibility of Russian communist aggression. Do you feel that this is a, a real source of difference between our two countries? I would think it's a temperamental source of difference in the main. 
Um, Americans think rather more fiercely about, about these things, and as I say, we are perhaps just a little more philosophic about it, and you may think that's very naughty on our part, but there it is. But we've no illusions about the possible dangers of these great blocks of totalitarian regimes in relation to the peace of the world. On the other hand, we, I would say this, that we are steadily on the lookout for the possibilities of changes in Soviet policy and Chinese policy to come to that. And if there were reasonably um, reliable indications of material alterations in policy, we feel it would be a bad thing for the world that the Western democracies should refuse to respond in any way. Meantime, uh, we're, not, we're, we're, we're not being foolish about it. Because no one wants to harbor resentments too long, Mr. Morrison, but of course we did lose more than 100,000 casualties in Korea fighting the Chinese who invaded Korea. But I'd like to go into the subject of resentment. Well, if I may interrupt you, I, I agree entirely about that, and uh, I understand the American effort was a very brave one, and you suffered a great deal. And it would uh, be foolish on our part if we didn't appreciate American feeling in that respect, which I think is generally understood in Great Britain. I want to go off from there to say that, of course, nobody took it harder on the chin or on the head, if I may say so, than the British working man during the German yeah. bombardment of London. Mm -hmm. now, how does how much of a split is there in the in the British Labour Party about the issue of rearming <coughs> Germany? Well, there's been uh, considerable differences of opinion about it. Uh, it's no good denying that. Um, in the light of the close majority in the parliamentary party some months ago, the not so close but still substantial minority on the national executive, and now the close vote at the party conference at Scarborough just before I left for the United States. I it is a strong difference of opinion, and you can't ascribe it to any particular body of political philosophy. It's mixed. The, the reasons that people oppose it are mixed. And I would say a high proportion of them are genuine and sincere about it. Um, however, the executive won, and uh, I think it is a good thing that they have. And I think that now we're over the top, so to speak. And there is an official party conference decision about it, which in principle has been accepted since 1950, but there have been reservations. But now that decision has been reached, I think that there will be a greater readiness on the part of the rank and file and some of the members of parliament to think about the matter rather more on the merits of the case and with somewhat less emotional content than, content than was the case before. Mr. Morrison, I must confess to you that there is, is a little bit of concern in this country over the possibility of the return of the British Labour Power, the B British Labour Party to power because of the publicly announced policies of Mr. Aniron Bevan. Now, just how strong is Mr. Bevan in your Labour Party? Well, now, um, we, we got a decision of the Parliamentary Party and the National Executive saying that we shouldn't attack each other. And so I'm not going to do it. Um, certainly not from this side of the water. But I don't want to do it. And frankly, I think that this particular angle of British politics is, has been rather overdone in, in the press. And um, a good many of the, our people are getting a bit bored by it. I may say so, I'm getting a little bit bored by it myself. So in the circumstances, perhaps, you will forgive me if I don't pursue it. Well, Mr. Morrison, on that point of view, uh, the return of the British Labour Party to power, we've got an election coming up in about three weeks in this country, so we naturally so think about that. When are, when's, going to, when are, when's there going to be the next, uh, next general election in Great Britain? When do you think? It must be held not later than 1956. And I don't know when it will be held, really, any more than you do, because it's for the Prime Minister to recommend the Queen as to the date of the dissolution of Parliament. And but you're no longer in his confidence. No, he hasn't told me. I'm not sure he knows himself. Well, Mr. Morrison, but would the... My hunch is it might be next year, but I, d I, can't, I can't be sure. With the retirement of uh, Winston Churchill, be the signal for you to call uh, for divisions and votes of confidence in the government? Uh, not necessarily. If, if the new Prime Minister and the newly constituted the government was to make um, considered and fresh declarations of policy, we might move a motion or an amendment to declare our point of view, which in effect would be a vote of censure on the government. It doesn't follow that it will happen. I think it is likely that if Mr. Churchill were to retire, uh, which is uh, for him to decide, um, and he had a successor, 
It is possible that that successor, within a reasonable time, not necessarily immediately, might want an election. Uh, Mr. Morris, may I ask you, how would you account for the fact that uh, since the uh, Conservative Party is back in power in Britain, there is an apparent return to prosperity since they have given the nationalized industries <coughs> back again to private enterprise? Well, I don't think that's got anything to do with it. And I think it was bad. I think it was bad to scrap the great idea of the coordination of all forms of transport. And I think it was bad to put iron and steel back, or, or they're trying to put it back where it was. But I, I don't think it, 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 it has made any decisive influence as a, as a contribution to prosperity. I would indeed argue that, if anything, it's the other way about. But I would argue this further, that considering that we had just emerged from a war in which our export trade had gone, our investments, had, overseas investments, had very largely gone and so on, I would say that the achievements of the Labour government in contributing to prosperity, full employment, increased production were enormous. And I would not admit for one moment that the achievements of the present government have, taking the circumstances into account, have been any greater, if as great, and as Mr. those Wilson, of the Labour government. Just have time for one short question. If you were to return to power, would that make any difference in the relations between the United States and Britain, do you think? <coughs> I don't think it should hurt relationships between the United States and Britain. Might conceivably improve them. Uh, I had a lot to do as a Deputy Prime Minister and a member of the Cabinet uh, in hearing the reports of Ernest Bevin about Anglo-American relations, and I conducted them as Foreign Secretary for seven months in 1951. And we got on very well with the United States. We're very fond of the United States, and I believe we would continue to get on very well with the United States. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Morrison. Sure. We're always glad to have you come over here. Very glad to be here. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Charles Collingwood. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Herbert Morrison, Deputy Leader of the British Labour Party, and Member of Parliament. Coast to coast, football tops the sports calendar. And coast to coast, the football games of more than a hundred leading colleges are timed by Longines, the most honored watch in the world of sport. Yes, Longines is official timing watch for Princeton, Harvard, Dartmouth, California, Texas A&M, Michigan, and Maryland, and that's to name just a few of them. And Longines is also official watch for the professional National Football League. Now, the greater accuracy and dependability of Longines watches of all types has been demonstrated time after time in competitive trials at great government observatories. For greater accuracy, for the promise of a long and useful life, for exclusive styling, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines. So when next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as an important gift, visit your authorized Longines Whitnor Jeweler Agency a leading jeweler in your community. There you'll find Longines watches in large array, priced as low as $71.50. Yes, the watch that times the football games is Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor watches.